Hi guys, uh, my name is Ken Coleman. I'm a digital artist from Ireland. Um, I also teach a uh, third level in game art design for Clamel Digital Campus. So I'm going to give you guys a tutorial in my own personal work, which you can see here on the screen. It's a mix of ZBrush, Photoshop, uh, photo montage, digital painting, and using a lot of texture. There'll be a bit of Corel Painter in there as well. So um, I hope you enjoy it. Um, so there you go. Okay, so when I'm acid building for some of my projects and I want to do my own 3D abstract parts, this is basically how I start. So I'm going to ZBrush and I go Spiral 3D, basic shape, drag it out by pulling down on my screen, and then I press T. And that makes my object. 3D model so I can move it around. Now before, if you're used to ZBrush, you need to make it into a poly mesh 3D to actually edit it. Before I do that, I need to go to initialize. And this is great fun for basic shapes. Bring up the divisions. As you can see, what divisions means is there's more polygons going in there so it smooths out. So my smooth model. Bring back the coverage on this so I end up with kind of more of like a horn shape rather than a spiral snail, a snail kind of shell. And then I want to, um, thickness is fine, coverage, yeah. and I want to displace it so it kind of bends, so I get something more like this. So these kind of shapes for me are great, because I often, when I'm teaching drawing, we look at using spheres, C shapes, and S shapes, which I learned um, from great techniques from other digital artists for, for building shapes. And I like to think of that I'm building compositional shapes and finding my shapes in my composition first and these kind of shapes help me to get a bit of depth so I often just start with these type of spirals so something like this could be used as a horn it could be the start of a dragon you know and um, lots of things it can be for the end of, a, of hair you know so I'm very happy with the shape so now I'll press make polymesh 3d and the next thing I'm going to do is I'll divide it twice which is geometry divide divide. I don't want to get a really high poly count here, so one is fine. Okay, if that goes up to four or five there, then it starts to lag. I delete lower, I don't need them. By deleting lower, it means that if I do use some brushes, you need, you need to delete them in order to use them. I like using this fracture tool. Broke the intensity, so it's quite a good bit of in-depth on this. Because uh, it creates this kind of lovely drag shapes that look like dragon scales. In the back. Just do a bit of that. That's it really. Do a three steps like this. Bring down the intensity a bit so when I'm doing up on there it's not so harsh. What I want to do now is I just get the chisel creature brush and I'll take the next shape and just add a couple of these kind of what looks like the inside of the dragon's neck to it. Use the teeth then to create almost what looks like suckers off of uh, an octopus just randomly thrown on to get that kind of shape going on okay I duplicate this sub tool which means it's like a layer in Photoshop by duplicating it and keeping the original if I mess it up it's okay I can make um, I have the original there um, I'm using only basic brushes none of my um, bought brushes or anything for this I bunch of stuff there from different websites. Snake hook and make sure your sculptress is activated. Snake hook won't work unless I had gotten rid of the other subdivisions. So I'm going to drag parts of it like this to create some extra tentacles. Connect like these tree branches or parts of the monster. And push this to the so I'm going to back. And go for those you know, spirally shapes. When I have something like this, I can put duplicated this as a sub tool, flip it on itself, make it more complicated by adding it to the original tool, or I can keep it like this and just render it up. Okay, so I would bring this now by pressing into the render I use, which is Keyshot, by pressing render, starting to render, Keyshot, and I press BPR, which stands for Best Preview Render. And I Export that with three or four materials, 
and that lets me uh, and then bring those materials into Photoshop and make a layered version of this which is then merged down and ready to go in um, Photoshop so I could spend the morning just making 10 of these and then those 10 shapes will come into Photoshop and be used to start to do a build up so I'm going to the dolly camera there one thing I love about Keyshot is someone who's been a photographer for a very long time is the perspective tool works very like a wide angle lens so you can change the lens I would render that out in red clay and two of my favorite materials from the Keyshot cloud is this blue rim that you can drag for me this blue rim nice to give some extra shadow and this gold zebra human skin gives a lovely translucency now I won't render them right now because if I render them right now it'll take forever and um, but when they're finished they look like this I'm going to go into my ZBrush elements and this is where those three materials have been brought together and layered up and auto colored in Photoshop this is a floating uh, Photoshop file ready to go I have some some of my brushes yeah there's some extra bits in there and some of these are purpose built like this just completely using my own stuff so I have rendered out some of my abstract ZBrush shapes that would become the um, either custom brushes or parts of the uh, overall composition uh, of the hair of my subject. You know, so what I do before to prep all of my um, kind of abstract horn tentacle shapes is they've rendered out in three layers of materials from Keyshot. So I have this um, which is called a blue white room layer. And I have this translucent ZBrush um, skin layer. So I bring them both into smart objects over my original in Photoshop, snap them into place. You know what? I grabbed the wrong one. Hold on. Yeah, wrong one. Let me see. That was those ones. Yeah, these ones too. I should. So I just do three of I do three of each render. So each turnabout or flip of the 3D model, I do these three layers. Okay, and I set the two of these to soft light. Okay, drag all three layers, grab all three layers, I duplicate those layers, and I merge those layers. Okay, and next thing I do is I get this lovely translucency is I press auto color, and it gives me this kind of more organic kind of browns and greens coming through. I duplicate that layer, and I go to camera raw filter, Bring down the exposure slightly, shadows up, and I like to bring up the clarity as well so I get this much more depth in it. And if the blue tones are too much for me, I'll just go into a bit of yellow. Right there. Okay, when I'm happy with it, I can delete the originals and just be left with this one floating layer. And I'll save that out as um, I'm calling just Luke Tentacles to go with the project file. As you can see, I have a bunch of them ready here. So Luke Tentacles Photoshop, done. So that's how I would layer up my renders from Keyshot into Photoshop to get these lovely translucent colors. As I've been discussing, I often start with uh, just a, a kind of a portrait image uh, from my work. I've learned over the last couple of years that I it's nice and a bit of a challenge to not use a studio setup too much. I've often taken photos on my newer smartphone or I carry around a little mirrorless Olympus and if I can get some good dramatic lighting like one light from the side or good daylight it really helps me to get a dramatic shot to start a process from and the the portrait itself is often determines where the work is going to go now I use this to kind of let the subconscious take over and not really have a final image in mind and just to kind of just go with the flow and this helps me to really enjoy the process of um, creating my own artwork with um, that uh, moves away from any commissions or, or other people's ideas. Okay, so in this instance, I've taken a photo of my son, Luke. He's having his breakfast, which is great because when I photograph him in the morning, he's got good bed hair. On the right side image, which you can see, is one studio light that I often just leave set up in the living room so I can sit across from him, the TV's behind me, and I can shoot and get some good dramatic lighting. Okay, so I won't go crazy into the photo editing side of things because that's not really the the main subject matter of this tutorial but I will show you that when I start an image I go usually to camera raw and my basic settings are where I always bring up the shadow down the whites and highlights 
and up the clarity because I get this kind of more painted looking definition straight away. The other thing I always, always do with my images is I duplicate the layer, desaturate the layer, and I set it to soft light and I get harsher shadows. Okay, and I unsharp mask, which is sharpen, unsharp mask at about 130% at 1.3. So I need to, if I was going 150%, it'd be 1.5, etc. etc. That's how I usually sharpen my image slightly. It was an old tutorial I got from years ago, can't remember where, but it was about the idea of giving a cinema grade photographic feel to your images. And I love cinema posters and, and old cinema posters, how you get that real dark shadow look. Okay, so that's how I prep my image. Now, you can merge these two by selecting both layers, layer, merge layers, or on my Mac it's Command or Control E. Now, for any of you who've used Photoshop before, a lot of selection tools, especially in 2020, where you can select subject and just cut the person out straight away. Luke has very crazy curly hair, so because I'm using a screen tablet, like I often use my either my um, XP Pen Artist Pro 15.6 inch at home, or for my college work, I have a, I'm very lucky to have a 20 inch, 27 inch Wacom screen tablet, a Cintiq. So, but I, I often, because I'm using screen tablets, I will just cut with a lasso tool around the edging like that. And just go around and keep adding to the selection. And I'll mask out parts with the magic wand, bits of the hair and stuff, and so forth, until I get just the head cut out and the shoulders. And sometimes I'll keep the silhouette of the body here, because with a gradient tool later, I'll use that silhouette to kind of get a feel for the other shapes I'm going to bring into the image. Okay, so here I've worked on my image a look a bit. Okay. Um, cut it out the way I want. A uh, piece of the hair was missing, so I actually grabbed a piece off of the side here, duplicated it and stuck it on top, and using a mask, where I've added a mask here, and using the a very plain old, uh, like one of my kind of my homemade cloud brushes or a simple soft brush, I've just edited around the edge here to make it feel like it fits in better. Okay. Now, I use two plugins in my work that you don't necessarily have to use to get this type of effect, but they really speed up my process. Um, I worked as a photographer for a very long time and, and we had to retouch a lot of model photos. It takes a long time and a bit of practice to learn how to smooth skin. So you would use um, either the blur tools like Smart Blur, Surface Blur, or you also use the um, patch tool for doing things like this. And if you're on the right layer, would grab a selection of skin and get rid of like the mouth is dirty, mouth is dirty around there, get rid of this cuts and marks on his face, um, the scars, anything like that. This is the kind of basic retouch you would do. But you could find out those details from any YouTube um, video on skin retouching, on um, beauty retouching. It's it's those basic um, every uh, step one to ten kind of to-do lists for that kind of work. And um, one thing I do love doing is on a separate layer, if I'm really stuck in an area, is using a soft brush and um, set that layer to maybe about 80%, 65 to 80. I would just uh, be using the alt button screen grab and start to paint in colors like this, you know. And that is something I, I would might revisit later on when I'm getting um, extra layers on top to get a more painted mm -hmm. feel. But for right now, here's my two cheats I use. I go to filter and I have Anthropics Portrait Pro. I bring my Portrait Pro. It takes it out of Photoshop for a second and I get this uh, professional portrait um, editing app that I've used for batch processing on a lot of my model shoots to really speed up the process. It could take anything from 20 to 40 minutes with, ex with um, experience to airbrush photo. And what I like about using this app is it speeds up that process, but apart from that, also I like to see what happens to my image. I turn face sculpt off all the time because I don't want to distort uh, Luke's face here. I want to keep the, the kid's face and all the proportions. But um, I've already skin smoothing, so you can turn, they're just great. They're just look, uh, gradients like that. You can bring them up and down. You know? And it gives you um, a before and after, so I can see where it's smoothed out a bit. And, I like it because with a bit of extremity, 
it gives the feel of something like uh, an old soft oil painting with chiaroscuro going on so I'm like dramatic lighting from one side and then when it comes back out boom there you go show you the difference now okay that's the first thing I do now I'm going to grab those two layers copy them and merge them turn off the ones I don't need now what I also have here is a little bit on his chin from um, from that's a bit cut very harsh I actually really like playing with the lasso tool because it's more like a paint, painting with a hard edge brush on the edge. And I love to do this because it just brings me back to the idea of drawing rather than using just, you know, always using automatic apps like uh, Magic Wand. Magic Wand is great for some stuff, but I like that. I like the mistakes. The mistakes can kind of influence me in the work and, and help me to find um shapes and interesting little abstractions that I wouldn't normally see. Just go and fix it. Okay. Now I'm very happy with the face. There is a bit of noise, but that's going to go away in a couple of minutes because we're going to use some um paint over filters. Now filters that I often use in my work and in combination ways in Photoshop are the noise filters. So if I want to create a blur in my work, I don't use Gaussian blur. It's a photographic um it's like a virtual photographic blur. I don't want that. I want to create something that looks more like it was a softly oil painted blur. So Dutch and Scratches will give you that feel as well. So you do something like that and it gives the feel of a soft kind of brush like that. And of course I duplicate out the layers and mask off the parts I want to keep sharp and the bits I want to blur out. Okay. You can also experiment with medium to do the same thing. Like this. But for right now, what I also want to show you is if I duplicate it one more time, I've also got this great plugin that um, helps me to build up, um, if I'm doing a lot of this kind of um, illustration work with photography, this helps me to get through a lot of the build up fast because what I'm really doing here is building the shapes and blocking in the areas using my ZBrush assets and my textures, see how they all fit together. And then that goes on to become the illustration by bringing it into Painter and back to Photoshop. So using filters like this Acviz Oil Paint, which I love. One thing about plugins that you've got to be careful of is if you decide that with your subscription, oh, I'm going to update my Photoshop, often you have to repay to have an update of the uh, plugin. So for in that case, I use two versions of Photoshop. I use 2018 for all my personal work and for education and for college I use 2020 to show all the latest updates. So I get something like that. Now I have it tweaked here with the sliders to where I want it to be. Okay, and I get that kind of effect. Now it is quite a little bit pixelated and quite automatic and almost works like a, a Photoshop plugin of some of the apps that you see on your iPhone. So I don't want to overuse it because I don't want this to look like an app processed my image. You know, I don't want it to be a preset filter I wanted to just give me a bit of a guideline. So what I like to do is I like to paint bucket that in with a mask, black so it disappears. And using one of my own brushes, which is based off of either towel powder or cloud, I go back in with the white brush and then just pick out some areas where a little bit of paintbrush can help and get rid of some of the noise from the photo. Just like that. You see, so somewhat painted. Now, as you can see from the original image, I've also cut out Luke's neck. I'm not using it right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him a fake neck. How I do that is I go behind all my layers. You can see I've pre-made one already, but I'm going to show you how I did it. Just behind his ears there, make a square. Gradient tool, taking one of the darker of the browns from the top image. And I always, always set my gradient tool to the second option, which is foreground color only. Okay, and a new layer, drag down, and get this feeling of a neck kind of shape. Obviously, it looks very square, so I use the warp tool. And by using warp, I can drag it in behind the ears and drag this out to give the impression that this shoulders. And I get this kind of a bust image now. Okay, so laying out all the groundwork here. Something I had a lot of fun with years ago. Um, okay, if I start that again, I always start with using just the flesh tones of the image to block out my image and to get all the shading correct before any color adjustments come in. 
Okay. So what I would really like to try now is I'm going to take Luke's forehead. I do this with all my images. If I'm very happy with the two of those, let's, let's merge those and see how I get on. More painting will happen later, so I'm not too worried about any pieces of photo with uh, too much noise right now. Take a section like that that's got good light to dark that matches his face. Let's drag that up now. And now I'm using 2018 for this process, so the shift button hasn't been activated. So the newer, if somebody using 2020 Photoshop, you know that uh, you don't have to press shift anymore. The older versions of Photoshop, you still have to press shift. There's a lot of noise there. So the next thing I want to do, I could use my noise or other maximum. The maximum is very fun because it gives this um, kind of idea like an old uh, pointillist brush stroke. If anyone doesn't know what pointillism is, when you're doing your, if you're doing any fine art history, for school, have a look at pointillism. It might give you a couple of ideas. And what I do then is I have my RGB neutral gray background, which I always start with. So it's R128, G128, B128. They're the numbers. And that gives me a very neutral background that if I set something to soft light, like I just did over it, it helps me to um, create a slight bit of difference between the foreground and background, giving some depth and keeping most of the color. Okay, so now it's starting to look like a kind of a nicely structured portrait. I can see that Luke is slightly, Luke's head slightly to one side. So I'll go back to my original neck, grab all these layers of Luke that I'm using, by pressing shift and selecting top and bottom, gets all of them, and then command to grab the neck. I just want to shift him over slightly. Let's just grab the top piece now here. His little uh, digital toupee there. As you can see, we put in because the top's cut off. Okay. But a lot of his hair would be a guideline for the abstract. That's going to come in very soon. Now the next thing that I've blocked in in my my um, folder of files here um, are particle alphas. Okay, They started out like this. Johnson's baby powder on black paper. Okay, craft paper. And brought into Photoshop, brought up the contrast and I get these lovely space effects that I use can be made into brushes, whatever you want, but I like to drag them into my image, bring up to kind of the, I feel that it's like a silhouette, go, go around the silhouette, put it behind the subject's face, set that to screen on the blend modes. Anyone who doesn't know what a blend mode is, because there's actually no label for blend mode, a blend mode is here in Photoshop. I'm sure any of you who mess with Photoshop will know what it is. And screen means all black becomes transparent, so it can now create glows behind the head. I have a couple of these built up already and I love the fact that the particles give a kind of a slightly space effect. Okay so that's where I'm at now with Luke and let me just make sure I'm going to I have a vignette already made by doing gradient of black on the edge. And the next thing I'm going to drag in this is all in the support file folder that will be um, that will be with the project files. This is weathered concrete Camera Raw updated a little bit in uh, in Lightroom or Photoshop, and I was just shot with my iPhone XR. It's my favorite toy because I don't have to bring a big camera out with me when I want to explore textures. Photos like this are just for my car park from where I live, in the building I live in. You know, and uh, when you get stuck in the textures, you can't unsee them; they're everywhere. So I drag this texture in, and I find that simple concrete will give you great skin. You can use it for planets, and you can also use it for lovely textured, painted looking backgrounds. Okay, so here we are with Luke now, my image of my son. Really getting to a stage where it feels like this is becoming some kind of classical oil painting. Just a couple of layers, all the layers there. Start to just delete stuff I don't want. I've also got a white kept so we can see where the silhouette is. You know? Now, if you've watched, there's a, there's a ZBrush section to this tutorial that you do not need to use the ZBrush part if you don't want to, simply because with the support files that are coming with this project, I have already laid out a load of ZBrush as Photoshop files for people to use. Okay, so I have all these dragon tree elements that I've made in ZBrush that become the hair on my image and are inspired by the big head of curls. So I start to drag these in. 
keep a couple of them behind the image to help with the silhouette. Mm -hmm. And even I do like that I have harsh cuts in the hair. I bring these in, and flip them around a bit. And you remember, all I'm doing here is really trying to build a silhouette for the image before. And see how that shape now goes really nice with the hair there. The ideas for this image were um, inspired by the, um, and you'll see with some of the support files, Luke is half Colombian. Okay, so my uh, my wife is Colombian. His mom. So, I'm bringing all these parts like this, I'm using masks so you can mask them off. I've already set up all the colors here the way I want them. And uh, scrub just random ones to see how they kind of fit. I've done enough of them that maybe I don't do need to use them all. Some of them might not suit the image, some of them might. And I've, I've actually I've made custom brushes from these as well. Just try them like this. I will color adjust them at a later stage once the build is done. Okay, so you do something like this, drag them in. And I often find when I'm teaching my students, and I have a very bad habit of myself, when you start to drag in elements into Photoshop, you tend to make them bigger than they need to be. Like Luke's head right now is more than 30, I'd say more than 30% of the image, and you may have to scale down. If we think about this image being used for, let's say, an album cover or an editorial, there's got to be in about 30% of the top of the image along here that would be needed for a label or a magazine cover or a CD, and more, more space for a base, you know? I'm going to take this, I really like this one, and if I flip it using a transform, I use free transform with the pen tool, it may look nicer on the eye, like that. Okay, but I'm going to, and it's going to bring it in soft light, let's see. Let me try it on overlay, try it on hard light, just bring in the opacity of it. Okay, we'll keep the normal and bring on the opacity. Okay. So that looks kind of cool. Um, I'm not sure about this curve yet, but we could just uh, airbrush it out with one of my brushes. The brushes that I'm using, these brushes here, are all made for my own paint brushes, my own textures. I have some very basic brushes, and some of them are just zebra shapes that have been screen grabbed and brought into Photoshop to make a brush set. So these are available to make these images also. Okay. So the next thing I'm going to do, and it'll be the last thing I do to start this um, this mock-up and this part of the tutorial, is also I am using Colombian gold. I shot all of these myself in the museum in Bogota, which is the, the capital of Colombia. I will use some of these to bring in elements that, when I start using these texture and photographic elements in my work, over the portraits, it really helps me to work in the the um, the kind of mythology that I'm creating and I know a lot of fantasy if you look at any of the archetypes like Joseph Campbell which is part of what I teach as well most archetypes within it most fantasy archetypes are based on the cross-pollination which is mixing of cultures you know taking different things from different men. I'm Irish which means I, I, I know and have experienced quite a lot of mythology in Ireland you know, if any of you like Game of Thrones, you should see that the map of Westeros is Ireland and England stuck together with um, one of the countries put upside down. So there's a little nerd fact for you. So there you go. I brought brought in, so he's got some kind of elements of uh, Colombian folklore embedded in his face. And if we were to bring the opacity down on this one and maybe match it up over his eyes, we may be able to create something even more abstract. It's kind of almost getting a kind of, he's wearing kind of war paint, you know, something like that. Now, I don't want all of it, so I'm going to mask that, and we're going to really subtly mask again like this, and very subtly with another soft brush, just bring in a couple of elements in the face. We don't want to overdo it because we do need to bring this into Painter and do a kind of an abstract blend that will help me to get to the next stage of the artwork and then the colors and the final colors will come in later on. The next thing I want to do before I bring it to Painter and the last thing is go into my uh, textures folder again and I have, these are some of the textures I've made in my studio. This is Pebio paint. It's a mixture of acrylic, 
oil paints and alcohol inks and oil paint and how they all react together to get these lovely effects. Okay. I also have a lot of these type of paint textures, which is just using palette knives, thick acrylic. Um, I even have a copy of Luke here where I have printed out pages, pasted it back on a board, put more ink, tore it, and I can bring that actually in and make an overlay of his face from last year, because that was a year ago, put onto the new one. But if these kind of textures will come in really handy for creating parts of the head. So if I was to bring it in here, soft light it again, see where the shapes complement the face. So that circular piece, piece might just go right, what if it sits there? on the eye and the cross hatch could go on the nose. Again, mask it all off. And using a texture brush or soft brush, bring back in some of the elements very subtly like that. I'm going to copy it and flip it horizontal so I get a symmetry on it. A bit of symmetry. Bring up the side slightly so now it's slightly asymmetrical. Again, not too worried about colour right now. I did find it's getting too yellow. What I can do is behind Luke's head, I'm going to set an adjustment layer. Bring on a saturation slightly and bring it maybe up into a complementary bit. So it's slightly blue. And another adjustment layer for color balance. Make those kind of more blue. Now his head pops a bit more, so now we're, we're really getting there. Okay. And I want to bring in a bit of the Pebio paint to his head before I bring it to Painter. And stuff like that. And see where these marks may suit on his skin. This could all come in again at a later stage. Oh, that's right there. I like that curve on the neck. I'll duplicate it and I'll put another one. So you know it's looking really nice on the eye and how it's coming out of that shape, that zebra shape there. And then we'll put another one of those. Same, just it's repeat and rotate, repeat and rotate, building up what is complicated looking image, which is made out of two or three simple elements. So now it's starting to come together like that. So what I will do is I'll save this for now. I'll duplicate it. And here's here's where I have a bit of fun with Painter, to prep for Painter before I take it anywhere else. I will save this, but first I'll, du I'll duplicate it. So I duplicate image, so now I have two copies. Okay, I'll save that one. And I'll save as look for IFX version 4. And I keep giving them version names because as I iterate and as I keep making different things, I have the older versions. I don't save over the original, if that makes sense. Because in my experience of doing this for clients is they might go, oh, well, let's go back to version B. And you've manipulated version B so much to turn it into version C and saved over it that you can't go backwards. It could take you hours to figure out exactly what you did, especially with my process, which is quite random and working with a lot of experimentation. So I have this one. What I want to do is I'm going to flatten it. Okay. So now I have a flattened version of the loop here. I want to copy, I'm going to press Command J a couple of times, make a couple of versions of that layer for Painter. What I'm also going to do is take the original one, turn back on that white background for a second, duplicate that again, flatten it, Me, and one thing about Photoshop, somebody might watch this video and go, what's a better way to do that or a different way? I love the fact compared to 3D programs, just hundreds of ways to do anything in Photoshop, whereas you really have to follow a step by step when you're using something like ZBrush. I'm going to make sure now here, by pressing similar there in Magic Wand, all white is selected. Deselect any white that's in the center with the lasso tool, the image, because I want to keep those. Okay, so that's all there, all done. Inverse the image, inverse the selection, which was select, inverse, and I'm going to copy, paste in place. Now this version of Luke where he's completely cut out, select all of it, find a really vibrant color, and fill that on a new layer. 
I'm going to save this version as loop for IFX version 4 alpha. So I have a shape of loop that if I'm flatten the image at any time or anything else, I can cut just him with all the blended layers back out. And the reason I want it is I copy it, Command C, paste in place, select again, copy him from the background there, paste in place, delete the alpha, and there is Luke copied on top of himself, ready to go into Painter. So I'm going to save as look for IFX version 4 Painter. So in Corel Painter, which is the next phase, I will start to do some abstract blender painting with blender brushes to give this a whole new level of painting. Do that on a couple of layers and then it comes back to Photoshop and we do more texturing and more adding of 3D. One last thing I would like to do in Photoshop to prepare this piece before I take it to Painter for blend overs is here is my copy of the artwork as it stands with my alpha layer on top and all these layers of my subject lined up so I can do different blends on them. I'm going to copy that a couple more times. I actually, what I'm thinking is move those into one. Don't need any of them right now because what I've done is I've made another copy of the artwork, taken out all the subject elements and kept only the background layers and merged them down together. So this is the canvas on its own. So I'll drag that canvas over here place it behind the model, so it's exactly the same spot, but on its own, okay, a couple of copies of that, by pressing command J, delete the background, so I have the background and my subject separate, and save as, so this is Luke for IFX version 4 Painter B, so I know which one I'm going to open in Painter to start doing my paint over. So that's my final step in Photoshop for now. So now we're going to move over to Corel Painter. So I have Painter open. Go to open, find the file. Because I don't have so many layers, it's a much smaller file than the original Photoshop file. These, what I make now in Painter, will be brought back to the original Photoshop file. Now something as well with Painter that I've noticed when I'm doing my um, my pipeline is if I get stuck straight in, it'll always be selected that the back bottom layer on the layer stack will always be selected in Painter no matter what your selection was in Photoshop. So if you want to do some artwork, you've got to select, make sure to select the right layer straight away. I made that mistake quite a lot of times. Okay, now I'm going to make one more layer in Painter that I'm going to use for this brush, which is Spring Concept Creature. Now I only use about three brushes in Painter, but they have just a great effect. And I use this for some very organic, sketchy highlighting later on. But for right now, let's grab the first there. And I'm going to use my Fracture Blender. Now it's in my shortcuts from my history. Let's actually turn off Photoshop to kind of get as much memory as we can. Okay, so here we go. Here's Luke, ready to go. Fracture Blender Blush, which can be found in, we just go here to Brushes, it can be found in Blenders, Fracture Blender. So I use Stencil Oily Blender, Speckle Diffuse Blender, and Fracture Blender, the three main brushes I use. They're a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I'm not there. And this is what it does. It gives me this kind of real, like, as if I went over the whole thing with a kind of a speckly palette and, and broke the whole image up. Let me just zoom in so you have a better view of what I'm doing. You can see how the image is starting to kind of break up almost like an abstract painting. So, there you go. So my method is usually to go over the whole face of the subject like this. With small circular brush stroke movements and some straight ones with straight edges to kind of give it the effect like that it was painted by an impressionist, a bit like an impressionist with some thick paint. It helps it also kind of for me to break down a lot of the noise left from the photo. And also what I love about it is 
Although it's kind of a fine art look, it has a sense of digital. There's a kind of a pixelation and glitch look, which I, I love glitch artwork, the trend. And it's got into a sense of a glitch mixed with fine art painting. So yeah, I love how these shades are doing. Okay, guys. Um, at this point, I decided, well, one, <laughs> the sound for some reason, I'm very sorry, had gone completely terrible and very noisy at that point. So at this point, I've done a speed up on the video and I'm doing a voiceover. So I'm going to explain what I was creating at this point. So if you've read the tutorial in IFX, I've used the term rinse, wash, repeat. It's just an old term for using the same process over and over. So I've kind of basically a step one, two, three method where you saw I came in from Photoshop, it's in Painter now, I'm doing a blend over and I do the blend over on many different layers as you can see up in the right corner. So I do uh, this kind of slightly circular brush stroke blend on the top layer to kind of get a very painterly but still slightly abstract but detailed piece so you can see all of it. What I do next is um, I will either use the Fracture Blend Brush or the Stencil Oily Brush and I'll um, do some larger strokes on another layer. Let's see what I'm up to here. If I can remember, yeah, I'm moving on to the Stencil Oily Brush and it's evaluating brushes because it's quite big on the memory, hence I closed Photoshop earlier. Yeah, I'm going big and chunky now. Yeah. There you go, and it's breaking up the image again. But I'm getting two different versions of the breakup of the image. So the first one obviously was with the uh, Fracture Blender brush. It's a little bit kind of like digital oil paint. This one has a bit more of a natural feel. And as you can see here, I'm using it for to pull the paint down like it's stripping off the canvas. Um, I love flat geometry mixed with circular shapes in my work, whether they're hidden or quite visible. And when you're doing something like a bust, I, I like to use what lo almost looks like graffiti, the way it drips down with a, a brush stroke on it. It's also very reminiscent of the style I would have brought into the work um, coming from the, the textures that are available with this uh, tutorial where I've used thick paint on, with palette knives and I've done kind of geometric and line shapes. Um, actually the palette knives I use are, are, are rubber, rubber silicone kitchen knives. Uh, you know the big um, spatulas you use when you're, if anyone's cooked an omelette. So I have a bunch of cheap ones of those and I just use them with thick canvas and I scrape the paint, acrylic paint across a, a matte black canvas to get those effects. So here now I am still using either the stencil or the uh, oily blender brush. Um, and I've just gone into the background and creating more of a circular brush stroke because it will kind of accentuate the shape of the head from behind. And now I'm doing one. You can see there's a bit of lag there now. Um, there was a bit of lag at certain points, hence the voiceover, because when I'm running the screen recording software and Photoshop at the same time, sometimes my machine gets a bit grumpy. So, just creating a bit of abstraction here. Quite speed it up. Bring the head back in. As you can see, it's quite really, and we're doing a white highlight there. And this is where I use the Spring Concept Creature Brush in and it's in the drop-down menu in Brushes in Painter, and it's uh, in um, the particle brushes okay and I have it on a very so you can see it's only on 5.1 up on the top very small and I use this with and I combine it then back in Photoshop with my uh, fine line brushes so what I'm doing here again is I'm pressing alt and when you press alt you can teardrop the color and select the color underneath it on the screen just like Photoshop okay so I'm, I'm pressing alt taking uh, selecting the, the color below and bring it into the brush Accentuating some of the features, the edges of the abstraction, getting a kind of a smoky effect. Where one of my things I always like to do is I like to blend the forehead of the hairline into the hair, so it looks like the skin is becoming the hair or becoming smoke. Kind of a bit of a, an obsession with creating almost what looked like headpieces out of hair and abstract, somewhat organic and mechanical parts put together. And um, Grew up in college, obviously loving Geiger would have been a major, major influence on my work when I started in college. So I um, actually did see an article about him and where he used to airbrush over large format um, photographs. And that gave me a lot of incentive to what I do because he didn't use Photoshop, he used an actual airbrush. So 
here we go with again with the fracture blender brush and another layer and a huge brush and just completely break up the image now remember they're all on separate layers this is going to go back into photoshop and we go from there okay here we have our image and what i created here was i took my version 3 and version 4 and combined them so the version 3 that i created which was all the layers and the version 4 which was all the painter layers which were merged I dragged the, mer the merge bits and grouped them in over the original image. And now I'm just using masks within, you can see I've grouped all the painter layers. And I'm using masks to go through different iterations of uh, the artwork. Uh, no, sorry, not iterations. I'm going just through different experiments to see what parts I want to combine, which bits of the painter layers and the brush strokes really fit into the overall image. Um, so it's a bit of just pl um, playing with um, masks painting with abstract brushes this comes back to the whole idea of rinse wash repeat and the step by step so i build an image using uh, bits of photography bits of abstract my main thing is try something organic with something metal or something mechanical in this case we use the um, colombian jewelry with the organic shapes that resemble bones or trees um, here taking part of the hair out and i brought it back into actviz threw it back on uh, with a mask, cut it out and threw it, uh, combined it back in to give a painterly effect over where the hair still looked quite photographic. So now you can see you've got two versions again, quite extreme, I'm making an alpha out of one. And now I'm going to show you how I create some abstract designs to go back into the original image in the next part. Okay guys, gone for a bit of a speed up here again. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm, this is version six. I'm going to do the same thing where I flatten, merge, and alpha it, and I'm going to flip it on itself using the darken or lighten blend modes to find more abstract symmetrical shapes, merge them again, cut them out, and put them back into the original version, which was the combined version of 3 and 4, which became 5. I'm sorry, that probably sounds very convoluted, but hence how I'm, again, rinse, wash, repeat. I'm taking the same ideas what I already created and, and flipping it and merging it and copying it on itself. So here I made a version in darken, darken blend mode. And now I try lighten and move it around. And I move these around like a Rorschach, like an ink blot test to find interesting shapes. Like I really like this shape here. Okay, I've duplicated and merged both of those layers. Now again, I flip these around. I like that shape with the darken filter. Okay. So I'm going to duplicate and merge like I did before. So I copy both layers, merge them into one layer, and I'm going to, again, cut that piece out using the Lasso tool or Magic Wand, depending on what would suit best at that point. I'm going to cut out these sections, and I'm going to place them onto a new um, composition. So what I'm doing here is I'm going to use this piece with the white background as a stencil to cut out the rest of them. Here we go. Make sure I'm on the right layer. Magic wand. And inverse that magic wand. Or the suit tool. Cut it out. Then magic wand and cut out the white I don't need. Now as you can see on the right I've just left the shape. Drag that shape onto a new canvas. Use that shape then. Match it up. I'm going to match it up into this, this one here. I'm going to cut that shape back out that I did with the dark in blend mode. Again, I'm going to use magic wand. Then I'm using magic wand here and I cut that piece out. There you go. I have it use it on itself. Same idea. I made an alpha. What well, I just use the word alpha, but I, I basically merge that shape into one. I use it as a stencil by selecting the edge of it and using it to copy it out of the the, the layer below it. Copy that onto the new and um, file, which will just be used for collecting all the abstract shapes. To make a collection of these shapes. By doing this, I have this, um, I also have this um, 
method for my abstract watcher, which is kind of in, in Ireland when you um, when you knock a pub, a bar, and it's it's or an old building and it's been knocked, you have what's called the cornerstone effect, which means you have to leave the cornerstone or the original foundation of the building, and for the new building to be built onto, so that part of the heritage is is um, is preserved. Okay. That might sound very abstract in, kind of, in terms of what we're looking at here. But in the same way, I often like that, that file I've made now, with the abstract shapes that are coming out of this piece of artwork. I might, when I'm creating my next piece of artwork, use them to make custom brushes or as block building shapes to start the next piece of artwork I'm going to do. It may have nothing to do with this portrait of Luke. It may be someone completely different, but somebody may ask me to do something in my style in this kind of abstract shape that may be used for an album cover or some kind of poster, it could be for theatre, who knows. But I have the building blocks from another image, so I would use those building blocks that I've already created, open that and start to use that to create something else. So I have whoa, terabytes in the stock folder of all of these assets I've built over time that I can always go back to and refer to. So I have an abstract 3D folder filled with pieces of uh, ZBrush that have been merged down and rendered in Photoshop. I have one or two ZPR, which is the ZBrush project files kept that I always go back to build on. And I have these type of files kept, which is just abstract shapes. So you can see that it has become quite convoluted, sorry, complicated looking, but it just started with Colum uh, Luke's face, the Colombian jewelry, um, a little bit of brush stroke, and a little bit of uh, ZBrush all blended together, flipped on itself, and then we start moving around and cut it back out. And this shape actually from the side almost looks like some kind of um, flying creature or bird. It's also an exercise used quite a lot in uh, concept art by certain artists. And I love it because I love using my subconscious. I love being able to get to the canvas and not knowing what I'm going to create. And then just working with what's in front of me. And I come up with something. I, by the end of the day, I've created something that I did not expect to create that morning. So that's what's exciting about using the idea of uh, using your subconscious for me. I never was the kind of artist when I was in school who pictured something directly in my head and was able to almost print it by using my hands onto paper or with paint. I was always quite jealous of those kind of people in art college. But it's only when I discovered through my research and even reading Imagine Effects other artists who would use this type of subconscious exercise. And when I discovered other artists using this, and especially with the digital technology, I got very excited about the possibilities of what you can do. And it always gets more exciting when you find a new tool, when you find a new plugin, when you find, I'm going to try some 3D, and you discover ZBrush for the first time, or Sculptress, and all of a sudden you go, whoa, imagine I could add that to my, the rest of my workflow. And that's, that's exactly what I've been doing over the last uh, 15, 20 years. So now I'm loving these shapes that I created here, and I'll keep this file, and I can use it again for many, many other projects. Um, eventually, I will dump those shapes and start a whole new fresh batch for maybe 2021. Okay. So now I have my shapes made. Going back to my version 6. Okay, I've slowed this bit down a bit just to show you some of um, how I'm going to start placing things. So I talked about negative space earlier on. In one of the tutorials where I like a lot of negative space around Luke's head here. And I'm just I've thrown in the Imagine Flex logo here so you can see why if this was going to be a magazine cover or an album cover, you need the space for the logos to fit. So you don't want to convolute those areas of the canvas or composition with too much uh, detail. Uh, there's a, you can see there's a, a guide down there at the bottom area where if it was an album cover or a book, it may have a title. And that's where the title will go, the title of an album. Um, or if it's a magazine, the title is on top, but the subject matter is below it. Okay, so this, um, in, in the video, I'm going to start speeding up again very shortly because I'm literally just going to be dragging in my abstract shapes and I make a couple of more abstracts with ZBrush and Photoshop with texture and drag all that in to really build up the image. Okay, so we're going to start speeding up now. Um, because this is quite slow and this video was originally 35 minutes long so now it's time to really speed up again okay so again back to rinse wash repeat okay this is speeded up quite a bit but i'm literally dragging in all of the sections that i previously made from the other file all the abstraction i made use where i flip the image on itself using darken or lighten 
and merging sec sections and cutting out sections um, from the other file and I'm now dragging those back in. I have a tendency to, to kind of leave my, my, my files float. I don't lock them to the, um, to the interface of um, Photoshop. And because I'm always using a screen tablet. Now, what I'm doing here, you might go, what's after happening? I use the alpha, the green shape, okay? I created a new layer and I used that layer to create a dark shadow, which I painted in a big soft paintbrush. Now I'm using the suit tool under the chin, fill the gradient, use the alpha again to cut out the bits I don't want. And this is kind of like a, a chiaroscuro technique, using heavy shadow and light to, to give more drama. Uh, the, the face has now popped out more from the image, all because I've added all this extra shadow. As I'm writing here below, note to myself. So these extra shadows, again, give me a feeling of maybe that it's kind of more like a classical painting. It's classical paintings with heavy brushstroke are kind of a big influence. I love art, Irish artists like uh, Louis Le Brocchi, who was very thick, used very thick paint to do his portraiture. So that's the kind of an influence in here and, and very negative space in the background again. Now here's one of the shapes that I thought would be very interesting to try almost the crested collar on my subject. You can almost get to feel like uh, it's right behind the shoulders and coming out and maybe there's some kind of drape going on. Excuse me. And bringing in more concrete. And start to kind of uh, just fade it out, use gradient tools to, to erase it. Using texture brushes. Those texture brushes I've created are from the same files. They've come from some of these texture paint. And so two or three techniques. Uh, it's same bits of ZBrush, same bits of texture, just use over and over again. As I said, rinse, wash, repeat. And you can see I'm using these textures to build up in different areas and I'm getting lovely little colors and textures, tones coming through there um, at the bottom of the image. And these pedio shapes, which I love. I did them on black craft paper so they would um, just have a very simple background. Because they're circular, they're nice for fitting around uh, the curved edges of a portrait, like around the eyes, or around the chin, around the nose. I use some color adjustments like color balance because there's quite a lot of green in there. Yeah, it's just messing around, building shapes, seeing what fits. Like the white there fits really nice with the hair and uh, the, the abstract zero shapes. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy with this so far. So the next thing I'm going to try, you know, bring in more, and at this one I set the pin light actually, just to see what would happen. Pin light's great for doing like vaporwave aesthetics if you use it with blue, purple, or uh, orange. Get really nice glows off it. Big soft brush for a lot of this. Now, adjustment layers. So I've created um, layer, new adjustment layer. I brought down the saturation, made it kind of more purple, and then to create another one there, the color bands. I'm going to be using the masks that originate with the layers automatically to rub back in the color where I want it more saturated to create focus and keep kind of a blue cold feel in the background and using the more warm tones around the face. It's almost like a subtle bit of complementary color there because the middle of the image is becoming warm and orange where the outside is cold and blue. And as I said in an earlier tutorial, I don't really need to worry about color straight away just as long as they match up a little bit because I always create these adjustment layers towards the end over the image to um, really start to control my colors. I may have a flattened image and end up with maybe two or three different color balance and hue saturation layers that I'm using to control, control color in different aspects of the piece. I'm using now the uh, tin stiff brush to bring in some white line that of course com combines and complements with the uh, spring concept creature brush I'd earlier used in Painter. I'm just using like little curly waves. When I'm teaching uh, drawing principles, I often teach people to look for the C and S shapes in objects because they can help you to create a lot of organic shape and a lot of uh, depth as well. 
so I'm very happy with how this is coming. We've lost some of the detailing coming in from the uh, the original photos that gave it the quite the quite tribal feel. But again, I'm going to add some of those photo elements back in over the image later on. And here I'm using one of my custom brushes that I created from the ZBrush renders. And what I do is, because I'm using a drawing tablet, I often have the mouse beside me and I click the mouse once to get a solid shape. Gradient it off at the edge and then try and fit that around. And duplicate, fit it, duplicate it, fit it. Use our transform tools to, um, to shape it more. I actually am much more comfortable with using the shift key and not the automatic shift in, in ZBrush in Photoshop 2020. So now we're back to version 4. Okay, the original version. What have I done here? I'm putting on a high pass to sharpen up the image because I'm going to take the face out of this one. Okay, so I'm taking the face off of version 4 and dropping it back into version 6 because sometimes when I do all of this work, I complicate the image so much that what happens is it gets overly convoluted and we're losing the original subject. So I'm dropping the subject back in, scaling it down to match up to where, remember I, I told you that I was going to bring the image down by about 30%, which I did to give it more of a, um, a better feeling of space in the overall composition. Get a loop spacer to where I want it. High pass again. High pass is basically duplicate the layer and go to layer, filter, high pass, and set that to soft light, and it almost embosses and sharpens the image in a way for you. There are a lot of tutorials about how to use high pass online. It's used a lot for, it would have been used before for a lot of HDR photography, before Camera Raw was kind of introduced. Here, I'm going to try another technique um, with my idea of rinse, rinse, wash, repeat. So I'm going to go into my ZBrush abstracts, so, and of course, as I said, uh, these uh, abstract shapes are available with the tutorial. So if you do not want to try the ZBrush section and you want to go straight into trying how to build images in Photoshop using Abstract 3D, you can just go ahead and straight away and use these. So I drag this into Photoshop on its own. Uh, this is a, coming again from a more kind of, I'm not too interested in smart layers or, or non-destructive editing right now, which is where everything uh, remains unpixelated. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop in a white background behind the uh, 3D shape. And the reason is, when I drag the textures directly onto the 3D shape above it and set it again to soft light, they become transparent on the white background. I'm not going to use any masking here. I'm literally going to drop in a couple of textured shapes. A couple of textures, should I say. And... Um, from my paint texture folder, which is the, the, the really kind of heavy, thick paint textures that I had created. There you go. When I'm happy where they are, they get dragged above and set to soft light blend mode, which means now they become transparent on the white background. Rasterize, so I want to. I don't want them to be smart objects. The free transform. I'm just going to drag them around so that the texture shapes fit parts of the. Um, I want to see where they want to fit on the image. Duplicate them and just drag them around again. I didn't even mask off the edges on this one. This is a very crude way of working, but because of the way I'm trying to be really abstract, sometimes I exercise less caution. In my work and I just want to go straight for the jugular, not rub out stuff as much, not create as many safety layers in my work. You can see from some of the other uh, iterations of this project I have what I call safety layers where I've duplicated them a number of times so if I make a mistake or do something drastically wrong where the piece doesn't work I have another iteration but I also have a bunch of layers that haven't been touched. Now once I'm happy with that I've merged it down, I press magic wand on the white, I select all similar, so I take all the white, inverse this, and cut it out. So there you see I have 
the ZBrush layer on its own with all the textures merged onto it. Now you could do that to all of the all of the texture, all the ZBrush sections in a folder, prep it like that that all the textures are already added, and then start and then start dropping them, if you wish, into your composition. It's up to you, you know. So at this point now, uh, again, rinse, wash, repeat. I'm going to start adding the original ZBrush stuff back over the image. I remember I've added the face back in, so I have more control over what amount of detail should be there and what I don't want to lose. So this is the final part where I show you just the, the final build-ups and again I am reiterating what I did before and bringing parts of the original artwork back in and I'm taking extra textures and um, overlaying over the original in the background, overlaying it over the, the skin of the subject Luke here. Um, again, it's it's all rinse, um, what was it, wash, rinse, repeat, repeat, wash, uh, rinse, wash, repeat, wash, rinse, repeat, should I say. And here I'm just adding some extra fine details, taking the colors from his uh, hair and adding it to, um, to create some uh, more line work in the, the hair paint over on the lips. At this point um, in the project I wasn't quite sure about the crests anymore. It looked quite, kind of cool but it kind of felt like it maybe looked like too much like a concept art kind of Victorian looking uh, thing. So I had this other photograph that I took in Colombia of um, of a necklace which I'd already pre-cut for another project and I'm really happy with it because again I mentioned before about C shapes and S shapes and how you can use them to build depth so here gave really kind of a sense of perspective for me and I thought by bringing it in, scaling it, squeezing it, doubling it up I might get something kind of cool out of it. Right now though I'm unsure because it kind of looks more like a big fluffy collar you know rather than kind of a kind of a tribal style Necklace again, that's because of the way I've stretched it. So it's looking good now, but I'm not sure it kind of fits the word I'm trying to go with the piece. I've kind of lost the um, I've kind of lost the paint drips that I'd early, I talked about in an earlier part of the video. I've lost the um, the kind of the, the where the paint is kind of um, scraped downwards and, uh, based on what I was saying about graffiti splashes and the paint drips. So it's kind of all fallen away as I've overlaid this artwork. And again, I can always take that section, if I wish, of the paint dripping from a, and open up another iteration where the paint is still visible, flatten it, cut that section out and bring it into this iteration of the artwork. So now again, I'm messing with the, uh, I'm putting up to the top here, you can see I've loads of versions of Luke's face, loads and loads of versions of the artwork. Really building up now the layers, so I'm bringing back in um, and there are a couple of adjustment layers so I can get the saturation the way I want it. So you know, I had the bluish hues in the background and I was keeping the, the skin tones to the front, but I wanted kind of more to, to look like it's on a, a textured white canvas. And then another, another copy of it again. So I'm flattening it out again to get one final, another um, alpha from the object, from the, the artwork. Now, what I did there to bring down the tone and to get it to kind of be just a, a darker shade of the artwork is I often duplicate my image my layer, should I say, and uh, on top of it I would set multiply and merge those two together because multiply is a great way of bringing down like, uh, almost the exposure like a photograph, you can really darken it up and it helps me to figure out what parts I want to keep shadows in and what parts I want to keep light. So here again I've used an alpha and I've created a high pass as I explained earlier, that's brought up, that's punched up a lot of the detail and kind of almost embossed the image. Now I'm using another 
the selection of the stencil and using soft light and those blue hues again getting some glows into the piece. And some more subtle kind of colour and I'll use an orange now again to take it from the hair and soft light again to see if I want to bring up because they're, they're basically my kind of go-to complementary colours is blue and kind of a teal blue and orange using quite a lot. Now I'm just using some of my custom brushes again to get the painted feel back into the piece and only using colours that I'm selecting from this um, almost final composite to really get back the drips that I was working with earlier. Again, it's all repetition, it's, it's taking sections, it's cutting sections out from previous versions of the artwork. And we're really building up something complicated and heavily textured. But all these complicated heavy textures started with very simple exercises. You know, the, um, if you look back at the very start, it just builds one or two iterations of those objects from ZBrush. And you can see them now that once they're all brought together here, they're quite complicated and quite busy on the head. But now I'm using an unsharp mask. Now this is a heavy unsharp mask. This is, um, like a 200% uh, uh, threshold of one pixel. And again, I'm just bringing in another bit of access Acfiz oil paint plugin to just pull out it and mask that off again. And I'm just going to use that to see what is it. Really heavy noise in some areas. It's from the eyes. And the reason there's a lot of noise there is when I took the photo originally, I had it on a higher ISO. Uh, about 800 ISO, now that's in photography terms is kind of high enough and when you try and get the image the, the green will come through faster than if it was at a lower ISO and it should be 200 but that's a whole photography lesson for another day. Through saturation again, I find when I finish my work if I pull the saturation down into the magenta slightly and pull up, sorry the, the hue itself into the magenta and pull up the hue and it just it kind of throws offsets the color slightly and then I can mask it back out and bring back in just the warm blues and oranges that I really like. But now I've added a touch of green and purple to the image too, so instead of two colors, I have four. Let me just screen grab that off again there from what I was doing previews. This is uh, now I'm into final draft underscore D, so that comes back to what I was saying about the client jobs is sometimes. You'll end up with a, just a bunch of iterations if you think you're finishing, but you're not quite finished yet. I was just messing around with the Imagine Effects logo here, just for in terms of that, balancing out the space in the, in the final piece. And making sure that if this is a, some kind of an illustration that would be used for a book cover, or if it was to be used for an album cover, there's just plenty of negative space below, above and below for like a band's name and the title of an album. So I'm going to call it complete. But I still want to go at it again. A bit more texture. It's the texture I took off of a rusty lamppost in, uh, in the train station with my iPhone 6 actually. But it's one of my favourite textures for really kind of just giving a bit of extra kind of almost painterly depth to images. So it's been really a back and forth and a back and forth to try and find the um, a balance between the heavy texture and, and, and not losing the subject. Okay guys, this is the final, final section. Okay. This is the final piece of Luke as it is. Now what I did also that you haven't seen in the recording is when I was finished that last piece you just watched, I actually merged everything again, cut the head off completely. And I made the head slightly bigger, about 30%, and I skinned in the neck here just a bit and, and using the warp tool moved it around a little bit more again. And again, it was a case of rinse, wash, repeat, just like I, I talked about earlier. And I used my uh, concept spring creature brush to paint in a bit more of the line work, a bit more, but I like to call it my Tim Burton spirals. And I also, what I did is I used the lasso tool under this, the chin here, made an understanding. So I'm using um, orange just like this, set to 
I knew there. Just like here, set to pin noise. I was able to create this glow underneath. You could either rub that out or mask it off. Okay, I'm just bringing a little bit of the glow underneath. See? Just off the chain. And I thought that had to really punch up the artwork. Okay? Now, as I said before, I had all these great artifacts in the face, but as I brought in other versions of Luke's face, I lost, I brought back in the eyes and I got great texture here, but I lost the details of the objects. So I actually have reintroduced them, the mask, and I have reintroduced the, uh, the artifact that I used for the nose and merged all that back together again. And the last thing I did was I actually drew on some own. The own is, uh, it's an old Irish writing. There was one with lines and carved into stone. And it actually says Gra. And Gra is the Irish for love. I'm using um, own, a bit of my artwork recently for something else. And also here, I'll just turn those back on so you can see. Build up with some of my own custom palette and brushes. Again, these are of course available in the um, assets folder. Okay, and I just added those again with pin lights just to get these kind of crazy kind of drip paints effects and glows on the artwork. And as you can see, I did some heavy hue saturation up here, painted over a lot of the abstract, um, the abstract uh, stuff from ZBrush. And it, I think with that line work and the extra blends in painter it all really came together. So this is the finished piece as it stands and this is, I'm going to say a complete because one of the hardest things you do, especially for me, that I've learned over the last couple of years when I'm doing this type of artwork is when to stop, when do I merge this again, flip it on itself, and keep going, and keep going, and keep going. But you just, at some stage you just got to stop. And I'm very happy with how this turned out. It's a good balance of silhouette. You can see the edging on the face, and I'm very happy with the colors overall. So I hope this uh, tutorial made sense. I know it's a bit crazy because it is literally repeating yourself and, 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 and cutting stuff out and sticking it back on itself, but it really is a repetitive process about building the composition, adding the photo elements, adding the 3D elements, duplicating that, merging that, bringing it into Painter, ripping it apart like a painting, like as if the whole thing was wet painting, you smudged it all with different types of texture brushes, bringing all those elements back together and adding and rebuilding it onto the original artwork so that you come up with something like this. Let's see if I have a copy of it yeah. when we started. So we started with something like this. And we built it up with the photographs from Luke into this with photos, get the overall shape as we liked it, then we smudged it all up in Painter. Started to draw it with the spring creature brush. Then copied it out, made the, the shapes, the alphas, onto itself, brought it back to Photoshop, copied all of these elements back onto the original layer. And we made the, um, the abstract shapes into a new layer. And now I have this great file that the next time I'm doing something abstract, if I see an album cover or something demonic even, but I wanted to have a kind of a bit of um, beauty to it. I have all these great shapes. This can be used for crowns. It can be flipped over and started to use as maybe some insects. This can be used for some abstract. You put some eyes and stuff in here in ZBrush or using some other kind of abstract tools and boom, you next thing you know, you might have the start of a dragon. You know, add some tea to it. This could be a crazy looking cave. You know, there's all of these different things I can do with these sections now. But it all comes together. And I really like that mask. And it's the, uh, this is, uh, Luke flipped over himself, it's set to darken Photoshop. You know, this one is a very, uh, I love using this because I just love how this could be used for, you could duplicate this and stuff and use it for spying, you know? But it all ends up looking like this, and this is the final image. So, thank you for watching, and I hope it was enjoyable, and I hope you get some ideas out of this. Maybe you don't want to use the ZBrush stuff. Uh, in terms of learning ZBrush, but yeah, at least the uh, abstract files are there if you want to play with it. Okay, so see you again soon, hopefully.